<laughs> so how are you this morning? Are we all right? Good. Um, just a warning, every time when there is a screen that turns orange, that means interaction. Um, so you will have to do something. So apologies in advance if you don't want to participate, but I hope you, hope you will enjoy this a little bit. So what I would like to do today, and I was really touched by Antonio with his message from Valencia, and I totally agree with him that life is a constant change. Um, so what I would like to talk to you about is what we've learned from 15 years of implementing learning analytics um, within Solar, but also particularly the Open University where I'm from. Yes, I will briefly talk about AI, and if there is time left, I would like to talk also a little bit about um, learning design, but if there is no time left, that's also perfectly fine. So there is this fantastic meta study by Hernandez de Mendes, and they looked at 17 large universities across the globe to see, okay, how have they implemented learning analytics? And in their study, they identified three big pillars. And I would like you to think about, okay, how is your organization focused on one of those pillars? And afterwards, I would like you to vote. So the first group of universities primarily focus on learners. So they've used data, they use data to inform learning analytics, and it's primarily used to measure, for example, the engagement of students, to enhance their engagement, thinking about how to personalize their learning, improve their learning outcomes, and perhaps linked also to PAT, um, you know, giving this data to parents of children and thinking about how they can improve their learning. The second pillar is mostly focused on staff. So how learning analytics and data can, for example, enhance assessment, allow teachers to give real-time feedback, make more efficient interventions, uh, for example, monitoring their students, et cetera, et cetera. And the third pillar is focused more on identifying where in my organization is there good practice? Where in my organization is there perhaps not so good practice. And basically, they are using learning analytics more on a kind of macro level to improve the learning design. So if I, if I do, do a raise of hands, which of you thinks that mostly in your own institution, you primarily are, are focused on learners in terms of using data? I only see a couple, okay? 20, 30, 40, 50, okay. Which of you thinks that you're mostly using data to understand what's happening with your teachers, to help to inform your teachers. One, two, three. I would say probably more or less similar. Who is focusing mostly on the third level, so looking across the institution? A couple. Who has not raised their hand? <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I'm mindful, I can't really interact, which is very strange, but come to my session afterwards because I'm really keen to listen to your stories, why this is the case. But is there anyone who wants to shout out briefly why you're not using data? Okay, let's come to that session later on. So um, let, let's give you a brief insight of my institution. We're the largest university in Europe, and we have a very large group of students that come from a so-called disadvantaged background. One in four of our students has a disability, mental or physical, and a lot of our students are already in work. So we're, op we're open to the world, but that means also, and it links very nicely to Antonio's talk, is that we can't standardize our program too much because people are so different at the Open University. So what we've been doing since uh, 2012, it says 2014, but we started actually in 2012, is we've been giving dashboards to our amazing teachers. And our teachers are basically able to log in to their dashboard to see how our students are doing. And we give basically traffic light, warning signals of how a student is doing well or not so well. Um, and then a teacher can click on each individual student and try to see whether, whether it works or not, and wh why this particular student is, is um, going well or not. So we started in 2013 with two teachers. 
Then we went to 2014 with 10 teachers. And by continuously and slowly learning from those teachers, we went bigger and bigger in terms of upscaling these tools. And in 2018, 19, we've made this available to 3,500. Now all 5,000 teachers have access to this. But the, the big conundrum is that only around a third of our teachers are actively using it. We know that every teacher that uses our tool has a 10% higher retention rate. 10%, that's quite a lot. So why are only a third of our teachers using it? The first one, which is not on the slide, I'm mindful that I'm being recorded, is they're not being paid to look at this data, right? So the second and third and fourth and fifth factor is basically we found huge differences in terms of how the university is supporting our teachers with this approach. So in certain faculties, um, there is a huge encouragement by um, the, the senior management and also on the bottom-up approach of encouraging teachers to make use of learning analytics. They employ the teachers as champions, they allow teachers to generate lots of evidence, etc., etc. So that really drove performance of, not performance is the wrong word, uptake of, um, of these tools. But another crucial factor, and I think this links to also the PISA study that Antonio showed, is um, all this kind of data requires a lot from teachers. And to be able to make sense of all this data requires a lot of understanding of the complexities of data. And a lot of teachers didn't necessarily feel comfortable. So in a range of follow-up studies, we then tried to really unpack three or four years after um, we launched this in, in, in a range of schools, trying to identify, okay, why are teachers using it and why are they not using it? And we found a, a quite diverse perspective. So one group of teachers said, yeah, I heard about it, but I, haven't, I didn't feel the need to use it. And when we looked at, okay, what are the kind of themes that they, they identified, they said, well, there's no training, no one knows about this, I have so many other priorities in life, you know, why, why bother, right? And then there's a group of teachers who said, I tried it in the past, but I'm not using it in the moment. And again, they identify a lack of training, a lack of understanding, etc., cetera, et cetera. And then there's a group of teachers who are very active about it. So I guess what I'm trying to, to say in an ill-articulate way is, we as, as organizations have to think really hard, how can we support our teachers to make use of these tools? Because the tools are out there, and we provide lots of training, but the biggest hurdle is not necessarily the technology, it's about how can we encourage these amazing teachers to actually make use of it. And then even if we make use of these tools, there's a study by one of my former PhD students. She put one of those teachers in a lab, and we basically did some eye tracking with them. And guess what? They made amazing stories about what these students were doing, but that was just not entirely true because this was not supported by the data. So I guess the story that I'm trying to slowly tell you with learning analytics is learning analytics is a really powerful approach to understand how you as an institution or as an educator can make use of data, but it requires a substantial amount of skills to make sense of this. And um, I think this is one of the big challenges that we at the Open University face Yes, we have all these tools available, but how can we make sure that we provide this in a sensible format to students? So the next part that I'm keen to look at to you is to think about um, how we can actually um, focus on the challenges of learning analytics. So there are, again, this screen is again is orange, so that means that you will have to do something. So one big challenge that has been identified in the literature is, is a notion around ethics and privacy. So how do you make use of this data? Is it safe? Is it, is it appropriate to collect this data? Then there's huge concerns about the scope and the quality of the data. Um, so for example, in uh, my organization, we have over 200 computer systems, and they all have their different definitions of how to, for example, talk about gender. I'm very mindful that gender is a very complex topic. 
But if in one system a woman is a one, and another system a woman is a two, then of course they can't talk to each other in that particular way. The third one is the theoretical and educational foundations. Even if you have lots of data, what does it mean? Um, lots of st uh, studies are also worried about research, that there's not a lot of research done. Then there are lots of studies and practice that shows that there's not a lot of practice. Okay, you can talk about learning analytics, but no one actually is using it. And then the sixth one is how do you focus on this on an institutional level? So are institutions actually using it, or is it that one teacher in computer science that has learning analytics in their portfolio, but actually no one is using it at all? And then last is the measurement of impact. So I'm going to go for another round. So who is mostly worried in their institution about the ethics and privacy of all this data? We have one, two, we have a couple. Oh, actually, much more. Then, okay, so lots of you are worried about this, and I think this is a huge um, concern. Um, who is worried about the scope and the quality of all this data that you have in your institution? Yeah, a couple, 20, 30, yes. Who is worried about this, the theoretical and educational foundations of all this data? Yeah, a couple, okay. Who is worried about the lack of research? No one is worried about this. Oh, there are a couple. <laughs> okay. Who was worried about actually doing it, doing it in practice? Okay, much more. So currently it's ethics and, and practice. Okay. And who was worried that on an institutional level, it's great that this one uh, teacher in, in computing is doing it. Okay, yeah, a couple. And last but not least, and this is my favorite, I hadn't mentioned this, but every time when I go to the vice chancellor, he says, yeah, where's the, where's, where's the impact? Where's the evidence that this works? Okay, so I guess it's ethics, um, it's about uh, uh, practice, and it's about the measurement of impact. So where are we at the OP University? So if you're worried about ethics, there's a free open education resource available about how to use this. We've, we're the first university in the world to have this ethics policy in place. But you're completely right that in terms of practice, there is some good measurement out there, at least within the OP University, but mostly this practice, this evidence, is, is nested within small units, not across an entire journey of our students. Um, and in terms of practice, I think there's a lot of need, at least within our own institution, of why do teach, teachers and students perhaps not always make the best use of this. So, I've talked a lot already about um, learning analytics, and of course, learning analytics includes artificial intelligence. But with the rise of Gen AI, of course, you have to talk about Gen AI. So I didn't color this picture orange, I forgot. But who is not familiar with this Swarovski Richter model? Who has not seen this model? Okay, but most of you have seen this. So it's basically four pillars of how AI is being used in um, education, and um, I've colored basically where we at the Open University are primarily focused on. So yes, on the left-hand side, we've done a lot of work on predicting. Um, we've done some work on assessment and feedback, and we're currently mostly focusing, I wouldn't say that intelligent tutoring is the best word, but we're, we're currently working on an AI assistant. Um, that basically we're, we're testing as we speak, um, which is very exciting. I would love to demo it, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure if this would be a wise thing. So I'm just going to share some screenshots with you. So um, what we've been implementing, and this paper has just been published, is we uh, are currently working on a range of um, AI tools that give um, teachers and students the opportunity to automatically create AI content in a safe space within the OP University. So our core asset, this is also linked to Antonio, our IP, um, we spend so much time you know, developing our amazing materials and content, we don't want to give this for free to JetGPT, right? So we're, we're basically playing with a kind of safe space that we created ourselves. And one of the ideas was, for example, flashcards, giving flashcards to students. Do you understand a particular topic? 
another one. This looks like a human being. This is actually an AR avatar. This is one of our professors, John Demang. And we gave this, this dashboard, sorry, this, this avatars to our students. And we were keen to, to hear from them, do they like this or not? Um, so when we ask what are the four services that students would expect from Gen, from Gen AI, from such kind of approach, they came up with four big um, elements. So one is, one student basically mentioned, um, it would be great to have this 24-7 support because I tend to work at different times than my tutor. So I could just ask that person, that AI assistant, hey, I'm struggling with this, where can I go? The, very, the other student, for example, mentioned, OK, it would be really nice to find additional resources. So when I'm working with the AI tutor, it could give me indications of where I would have to go next. Another student mentioned it's sometimes tricky for me to revise. So having an AI tutor would basically, the tutor would know exactly where I am and what I do well and what I don't do well. So in four times of th services that these students were initially stating, and this is just, I'm very mindful, the number is very small, it's just eight. Uh, but we replicated this study with uh, 100 students um, this summer, and currently a survey is live, and already 250 students have filled this in. And the results are more or less the same. So what they're looking for is some kind of real-time assistance, and they're looking for an, a tool that gives immediate query resolution. So the tool should know, oh, I'm in week 4.2, I'm very bad at math, so give me more math exercises in week 4.2. The other element is this personalization and accessibility. So, for example, I personally love diagrams, and I personally like to, you know, get a deeper understanding, so it would be really nice if my examples also include a lot of diagrams. Um, then it would be very useful to focus on academic tasks. So students were saying, I don't want to have a friend, I just want to have a, 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 an AI digital assistant that helps you with my academic tasks. But surprisingly, around half of the students indicated they also wanted to have some kind of emotional and social support. And when we replicated this with a larger study, it's a little bit like the English expression is like Marmite. You either love it or you hate it. So some students absolutely would want to have this friend, and others, well, others were really appalled by this idea. So what were the concerns from the student? So one of the biggest concerns, for example, a student is that uh, it knows so much about you. And uh, this particular person was afraid that it would replace humans. This links, perhaps, again, to back to Antonio. It's like, in 10 years' time, when we have all these AI uh, chatbots with Industry 4.0, would people like me still be needed if an AI digital assistant does such a better job than me? Um, another person wrote, and I thought this was a really good quote, um, uh, he works as a financial controller in a large clothing company and he was worried that eventually all these people will be replaced with, with computers or with AI bots, and then he was wondering about his daughter and about what's going to happen to her, what kind of job will she have in 10, 15 years' time. And another student was really worried about, what if my work is rubbish, and then the, the, the AI chatbot builds their models based on my work and gives wrong advice to others. So these are some of the concerns that, um, that the students uh, mentioned. So what I would like to discuss a little bit with you is to think about how you in your own institution are working with an AI assistant or not, and whether we should allow this AI assistant to freely roam across all kinds of digital resources across the internet, or perhaps whether we should develop this walled garden that it basically is only allowed to work with data from your own institution. And you could argue that with the speed of development of chat, GPT, and similar products, maybe we shouldn't do this wall garden. Probably the, the, the tools that we're currently developing are probably so inferior to chat, GPT. Why, why even bother? So I guess what I was wondering, and again as a kind of voting, is um, 
do you think it would be better to think about your own institution? Do you think it's better to just buy off-the-shelf AI systems? Or would you prefer that... Um, sorry, I'm, or, or would you prefer that it's more kind of a walled garden approach? So who is more for, okay, let's just... Let's just use all the tools that are publicly available. So I'm just going to stand here on the, on the left-hand side. Who is, who is more in favor of this? Only a couple. I'm surprised. OK. Who is more in favor of, OK, is, as institutions, we should focus more on kind of this institutional walled garden? OK, who hasn't voted? OK. Anyone want to shout out why? Both, mix. Oh, but how is that possible, a mix? That's impossible, right? <laughs> right, come and chat to me afterwards. Um, I'm mindful of time. I have nine more minutes. So that gives me a little bit of time to talk about my favorite topic. My favorite topic is learning design. So what I've been talking about a lot is data, data, data. But if you don't really know how you design your educational courses, all this data is useless. So what you need is um, real deep understanding of how your teachers are designing courses. So who has not seen this graph before? Most of you have seen this before, okay. <clears throat> so for those who haven't seen this before, I've been doing this for quite some time, so this is nearly uh, nine years old. We, we, we mapped how over 150 teachers across the Open University design courses at the Open University. And there are four types of teachers, crudely. One designs lots of materials and lots of individual learning, so-called constructivist design. One designs a lot of assessments and gives a lot of feedback. One, a third one gives a lot of doing stuff, which we call productive. And the fourth one is social constructivist learning. And what we have done and seen over the years is that the way how teachers design their courses fundamentally drive student behavior. So what we, for example, see is that if you design lots of social constructivist learning activities like student to student, teacher to student, student to teacher, this leads to much more engagement of your students in your courses. While if you, for example, design lots of amazing materials, but just amazing materials. This has a negative effect of student engagement over time. But if you look at, for example, this small thing called student satisfaction, the number one predictor of whether or not students love your course is giving them lots of materials. And the number one negative predictor for student satisfaction is, at least at the Open University, is whether students have to work together. Uh, but it is the number one predictor of student retention. So in our um, courses which are open, the biggest worry is retention. So we've always been struggling to square that circle. Should we focus on satisfaction or should we focus on um, retention? And in some of our studies, this is a scary looking graph, but in our studies we continuously show that more than two thirds of what our students are doing on a week by week basis is determined by us. We as teachers basically drive our students. The way how we design our courses fundamentally impacts our students. So when I talk to amazing educators who say, yeah, the students, you know, they're not working hard enough. I always put this in front of them. Because two-thirds of what students are doing is determined by us as educators. So if you're interested to improve your courses, and this is a shameless plug, is we've made a free tool available for any educator in the world. This is developed together with the European Union in a range of universities. And this tool automatically allows you to map your learning design. And the URL for this is uh, learningdesign.eu. And if you play with this tool, it automatically provides all this real-time analytics of your courses. And if you come to my workshop later, we will also play with this uh, tool. And, um, we have learned quite a lot from this already. 
and it's really fascinating. We have a lot of uh, users using this system, and the surprising thing is that most people find it really easy, which is the most exciting thing. And last but not least, and I'm very mindful of time, I saw an amazing bridge here with the, uh, with the swan neck. Um, so if you're interested in learning analytics data, there is another bridge you can visit, and this is a shameless plug. Um, so um, we're organizing the, the next learning analytics event in Dublin. So if you're interested in learning analytics, come to our learning analytics uh, event in Dublin. So thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to seeing you at the workshop. Thank you.